Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy Nash. Welcome to my fourth podcast. Today, I want to talk about the modern day music industry, and I want to talk about the influence it has on modern day culture, more specifically, the attitudes we have towards each other, the values that we hold to be important, and the quality of our relationships. But before getting into all that, I want to take a trip down memory lane and tell the story of Robert Johnson. So for those of you who don't know who Robert Johnson was, he was a blues guitar sing- singer-songwriter from the 1930s, and he's widely acknowledged as to being one of the most influential musicians of his generation. Uh, greats such as Muddy Waters and Eric Clapton always uh, referred to him as being one of their greatest influences in shaping their styles and being a great innovator. Uh, so Robert Johnson was actually actually didn't have a very long life. He died at the age of 27. And for those of you who don't know, 27 is kind of a magic number in rock and roll. Uh, it's not very magic, actually, because uh, there's no magic involved in dying. Uh, but a lot of artists that die young tend to die at the age of 27. For example, Kurt Cobain, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and also Robert Johnson. Uh, but that's a bit beside the point. Uh, What happened with Robert Johnson is that there's a legend around him, which I'm going to tell. And it starts off as Robert Johnson just being an ambitious, young, yet untalented musician. So to paint this picture, I'll just make a reference to American Idol. You know, these people who are convinced that they're great singers uh, and that their dream is to be a singer. And then they go on the show and then... Turns out they can't sing at all because they don't have talent. I mean, they have the desire to be great, but they don't have the talent. Uh, And it's kind of funny and embarrassing for them at the same time. Well, Robert Johnson was kind of the same kind of guy. He loved music. He wanted to be a musician. But according to his contemporaries of that time, and and this is actually true, a lot of legends of the time uh, acknowledge the fact that they used to think that Robert Johnson, quite frankly, sucked at guitar he was just really not very good and son house which is another legend of the time which uh knew robert johnson used to say and i quote put that guitar down boy you causing a racket you making everybody go mad so you know you get the the idea he's just not very good and and nobody really appreciated his music and uh, but robert johnson still persisted with his dream despite not in, not getting any validation from anybody Uh, which usually is kind of essential in the recipe for success. If you don't have any positive reinforcement from the people that surround you, usually you start questioning your talent and you give up. But Robert Johnson did not. And the legend says that Robert Johnson disappeared for about four months and nobody knew where he was. And when he came back after four months, uh, the four month hiatus, he burst back onto the music scene and people's jaws just dropped at how good he was he he just improved incredibly he went from being the the guy that nobody wanted to listen to that everybody was telling to stop playing to being pretty much the god of the time he was just unbelievably gifted after only a four-month hiatus so people were kind of suspicious they were like whoa how'd you get that good you used to really suck and now you're better than everybody in you know just four months Uh, What probably happened is Robert Johnson just probably practiced every day, eight hours a day for four months and and just became really good and and was able to reach his potential. But uh, the legend says that Robert Johnson, and this happened on a cold October night, as uh, Robert Johnson was making his way towards Rosedale, which is a town in the state of Mississippi, as he reached the crossroad between Highway 49 and Highway 61, he came in contact with a shady looking man and that shady looking man happened to be the devil. And so the devil made him sign this pact. And it wasn't signed. It was actually uh, just a verbal pact. And basically Robert Johnson gave, sold his soul to the devil in exchange for incredible talent uh, and technique at the guitar. And that's the legend. And it's said that Robert Johnson's amazing talent actually came as a product of him selling his soul to the devil. And there are a lot of more modern, although they're no longer modern today, songs that refer to this story. The most famous one is probably Crossroads by Eric Clapton, which is actually a Robert Johnson cover. But in the lyrics, he says, I went down to the crossroads, 
fell down on my knees. Which is referring to the crossroad of the highways and the fact that he's falling down on his knees as he makes a pact with the devil. There's another famous song which is called Traveling Riverside Blues, which is by Led Zeppelin. It's also another cover. Uh, and Traveling Riverside Blues, that's because uh, blues was invented in Mississippi and it was mostly in the Mississippi Delta. So Riverside is where the blues comes from. Anyway, one of the lyrics says, I'm going to Rosedale, take my rider by my side. Which refers to Rosedale, which is the city, the destination that Robert Johnson was heading to um, as he had his encounter with the devil. So anyways, that's pretty much the legend of Robert Johnson. It's a Faustian legend. And for those of you who don't know what Faustian means, it refers to basically any kind of tale which refers to a man or woman selling their soul to the devil in exchange for some kind of power or prowess. And the word Faustian comes from a German legend from the 1400s and the protagonist's last name is Johann Faust. And basically that tale tells a story of the, this um, erudite man, this really smart man who likes to study a lot and, and is quite successful but is not really satisfied with his success and ends up selling his soul to the devil at a crossroads once more in exchange for even more power to have even more satisfaction in life. And that's where the word Faustian comes from. Anyway, so just to close the parenthesis on the whole Robert Johnson story, the reason I chose to tell that story is because an important parallel can be made today with today's modern day um, music industry. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I believe that just like Robert Johnson, the modern day industry has sold its soul to the devil. And my argument basically is that modern day music, especially from the 2000s onwards and even more from the 2010s onwards, has lost its soul. Now, according to Christianity, animals and plants also have souls, but humans have different kinds of souls. Humans have spiritual souls, souls which allow them to communicate with God, which allow them to have consciousness, which allow them to have emotions which allow them to imagine things that are not real and transcend the material world, which is governed by your vision, what you hear, what you smell and your instincts and be able to create things such as Star Wars, for example, although Star Wars did not actually exist in the material world, uh, it exists because if I tell you, you know, if I refer to Star Wars, everybody knows what it is. So our soul is what gives us our humanity. It's what separates us from just being mere animals. And in the case of music, I believe soul is what gives music its humanity because music is not a human invention. Music already existed before humans existed in the first place. Music is just a very scientific process. It's, it's basically frequencies, uh, different kinds of sound frequencies that already exist naturally in nature, which create different kinds of notes. And then humans created this system which is called music theory which explains the natural phenomenon which is already inherent in nature and it explains how certain notes go together and certain sequences of notes actually make us feel certain emotions like minor scales make us feel more sad major scales make us feel more happy and there's it's very deep and complex uh, science to it um, and basically the, the gist of it is that we have seven notes, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, and then we have intervals, half steps and full steps. And if you rise by one interval, mostly, most of the time it's going to create a sharp or a flat and then certain intervals in which you skip one interval and you take the one, the three and the five, you create a chord. And that basically explains the sounds which already exist in nature, which for some reason, please our ears in certain ways, depending on the intervals you choose to to apply towards the music you're creating. So, so music theory is kind of like mathematics. It just describes a phenomenon that already existed in nature. For example, if you take a stick and break it in two, well, now now you have you before you had one stick. Now you have two sticks, and that's basically division. But you know that that phenomenon already existed. We just created mathematics to describe those phenomenons, which already existed in, in uh, nature. So basically, music already existed, and, and what gives music its humanity its is its soul. 
So when a computer makes a song and it just follows the laws of science perfectly by following the intervals and the rhythmic patterns perfectly without any imperfections, without any human touch, I should say, without any emotion, well, then this music is no longer art because there's no emotion in it. There's no, there's no imperfection which creates beauty. And I'm going to explain that. It's just science. And so when music is said to have soul, that means that the the instruments that are being played are are being played with emotion. It's it's a human that is playing the instrument, and sometimes he doesn't exactly hit that note perfectly in tune. Sometimes he's not exactly per pinch perfect on, on rhythm. Sometimes there's a slight delay, there's a slight flat, a slight sharp. And when the singer is singing, you just hear that raw emotion. It doesn't sound like auto-tune where everything is perfectly in tune. It sounds like a computer is singing. Instead, it's a human and humans are imperfect. And our individuality, which which gives us our, our, our beauty, is defined by imperfection. And people seem to think that the definition of beauty in this world is perfect symmetry and perfection. And I disagree with that. I think it's the contrary. It's imperfection which creates beauty. And in a recent study... Uh, what they did was they took these these famously good-looking people's faces that everybody could recognize, like actors and, and models, and they took half the face and then they computer-generated the other half such that it would be perfectly symmetrical to the other half. And a lot of people say that the definition of, a, of an attractive face is symmetry, but perfect symmetry was actually found to be unattractive. The, the faces look weird, and everybody that was asked to judge the two faces, like the actual face, of Brad Pitt versus the perfectly symmetrical face of Brad Pitt, which was created by a computer. And everybody seemed to say that you know, the real Brad Pitt was more attractive. And, and there's also this common belief, which a lot of people share, that you know, perfection is actually boring. People with perfect personalities that never break the rules, that just have every single virtue possible, and these people don't even exist. But those hypothetical people would be boring to be with because... What creates attraction, according to a lot of psychologists, are our are, are rough edges. Our imperfections is what attracts us to each other and, and our vulnerability and our honesty to express them and, and our comfort within those imperfections is what, it was what creates confidence and attraction. And there's a reason why, you know, a lot of people say that 90% of communication is body language because... You know, the way you say things, the emotion behind the words you use, not the implicit choice of vocabulary is what conveys most of the message. It's more how you carry yourself and how you choose to use intonation and, and the emotion that you put into what you say. And also for actions, it's not actually the actions that, that matter most in terms of conveying a message. It's more the intentions behind it. And that's why a robot could never make a speech which would move such people with such emotion as, for example, Hitler. And I know Hitler is a horrible man that committed a lot of crimes, but he was actually a brilliant public speaker and one of the most gifted of all times. But I can also, you know, refer to Barack Obama if you want a more positive role model here. And as for intentions behind actions, you know, that's what marks the difference between complimenting someone because you generally approve of what they're doing and want to make them feel better or complimenting someone because you want something in return. You know, a lot of people compliment people because they want a compliment in return and that comes from insecurity. And even though they don't implicitly state it with their words, it's written all over their face and, you know, people just know when people are insecure. And so that's why computers can't convey emotions the same way as humans can. And the same can be said for music. When, when auto-tune comes into play and when that overproduction which takes away all the imperfection of the human performance of the art come into play, then, then the music loses its soul and the music loses its emotion and vulnerability and, and individuality, which makes it human. And so the definition of art basically is a medium by which the artist communicates his emotion with the consumer of the art. And in the case of music, when the singer is singing, when he's singing with soul, he's pouring his heart into the performance and he's not hitting the notes perfectly like a computer and he's not on time perfectly like a computer, like a robot, but what gives him his soul and what allows him to communicate his emotion with the consumer, with the listener, 
is his inability is his, his ability to basically be imperfect and don't get me wrong computers can actually convey emotions by by choosing the intervals of notes that they choose to produce for example if i choose to produce a major scale with my my software or a minor scale i can create an emotion in the consumer but i'm not conveying anything i'm just using science to 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 use phenomenons of sound which already exist in nature and reproducing them with a computer same thing with autotune i'm not producing it from my heart from my own soul which is imperfect and vulnerable and communicates something much more powerful to the listener another thing i want to talk about is that the modern day songwriting process actually stifles the individuality of the message and the emotion that the artist is trying to convey compared to what it was before now before what usually happened was that a band would write a song and there'd be maybe two three four songwriters that would come up with this idea and, or maybe just one songwriter would come up with his idea and would convey the emotion and message that he wants through his song and then the, the producer would step in and make these arrangements to to make the the song more marketable and more enjoyable by the public but nowadays it's very different there's a team of writers for every song there's a team of producers which pick the beat and then there's a team of marketers which can alter the lyrics here and there and promote the song it, it's it's very much a team effort of maybe 50 plus people going into one song and creating a product instead of a work of art and what i mean by that stifling is that if i create a song and i write the lyrics i write the music i perform the music i play the instrument and i sing it and i'm not using all kinds of auto-tune it's just me it's just my performance well then i'm directly communicating my emotion from me towards you now if a group of people the more people go into this process the more the individual emotion of the indiv the original idea gets diluted because if two people write the song then it's no longer just my emotion it's two people's emotion and then if it's 50 people instead well then how can there be any individuality towards the message if it's just a bunch of different ideas being thrown together not to mention that most of the time the artist the one that's actually performing the song didn't even write the song so he's just interpreting a group of 50 plus people's product and getting the credit and being called an artist and being adulated for his talent but is there that much talent when all you have to do is read some lyrics on a screen and sing into a mic and your voice might not even be that good maybe it's just because there's so much auto-tune in production that it makes it sound good but if there, you take that away it sounds like shit and these people get so much credit and reveration as artists but i don't see them as artists i see these people as salesmen or saleswomen you know these these people have this persona this look they're usually attractive they have this this personality and all they do is interpret this song and because of the persona and the way they carry themselves they're able to sell this product which is basically are indeed and engineered by a group of 50 plus people so this is no longer art this is business and as i said before art is a medium by which the artist conveys emotion towards the consumer and modern day music i find in general is only conveying one emotion and it's not exactly the most desirable emotion that you want to be communicating and that emotion is vanity i don't know about you but if you go on spotify and you go on the charts top 50 songs in the world so this is popular music i'm talking about not all music obviously there's a lot of authentic great music out there but the music that's being promoted on the top 40 billboards which most people are consuming the message most of the time is basically comprising of look at how much money i have look at how many women i have look at all the cool drugs i can do uh, look at how good i am look at how much better i am than everybody else you should want to be like me because i'm cooler than you and you cannot disagree with that that's basically the flex culture message of modern day music and that's the emotion of vanity now, I'm not saying every single popular song is like that, but most of them are. Uh, or, you know, if it's not vanity, it's hypersexualization. It's basically describing uh, how much you want to have sex with all these girls and how every girl wants to have sex with you, which is also a form of vanity itself. It stems from insecurity. It stems from seeking validation from others. 
and, and comparing yourself to other people instead of comparing yourself to your own standards and having your own values and individuality and vulnerability. It's all about showing this superficial facade and trying to create envy in other people. But everybody knows that when you try to impress people, you know, whenever you meet someone new or you have a conversation and that person is just trying to impress you, unless it's a job interview, there's going to be no connection that is built. I mean, what builds true connection between humans is showing your vulnerability, is, is telling those kind of sob stories or showing your emotion and vulnerability is what's going to bring people closer and create a deep connection. It's not by trying to impress people. If all you do is try to impress people and get validation from people, especially women, you're just going to, you know, scare them off. Or maybe you will create connections with people, but it's not going to be the real you. It's going to be you putting on a front such that you can please people and get their validation. But the thing is, you can only fake it till you make you can't fake it till you make it. You can only fake it for so long. And if you fake it for so long and eventually once you've gotten comfortable with that person, you stop faking it because obviously you're going to revert to your original self. Well, why would you even want a connection or relationship with that person in the first place? I mean, people need to be individual and show their honest self. And that should be used as a, a filtration method right off the bat that determines whether or not you want to be friends or, or a romantic relationship with these people in the first place. And a great example that explains and illustrates why you can't really fake it till you make it and you'll obviously revert to your original self eventually is flexing. You know, a lot of people buy expensive cars and expensive clothes to show that they're actually rich and have this lifestyle so that they can get validation from people so that they can get approval and impress people. The problem is, you know, they don't actually have money. These people are poor and they're living a lifestyle that is beyond their means. So how do you do that? The only way to do that is debt and debt doesn't go away. Eventually, you're going to have to pay that debt. Eventually, you have to go bankrupt. The, the, the bank's going to seize that house, seize that car and seize all your, your assets, which you didn't even earn. You just pretended to be somebody so that you could get validation from people and eventually well you're going to revert to being your broke poor self which is pathetic in the first place and today's society is so incredibly insecure it drives me sick i mean you go on instagram and facebook everybody has their story everybody's showing the world what they're doing everybody wants everybody's validation all the time why can't you just you know go see that monument on your travel instead of you know, taking a video and posting it on your story for, uh, for everybody to see, to try to impress people. And by the way, no one cares. No, everybody's too busy trying to impress everybody else to care about you impressing them. You know, why can't you just enjoy the moment for yourself? Because that's what you want to do. And that's your own individuality and your own values. Instead of having the need to show everybody and get that validation. And I'm guilty myself of falling in that trap many times. I've seeked validation for my whole life. And I'm only starting to realize how stupid and insecure it is and that the true definition of attractiveness, which attracts people to you, is basically individuality and vulnerability. It's not caring what other people think of you. It's not needing validation. You know, being needy is what drives women away if you're a man and vice versa. It's doing things based on your own convictions only for you because you want to do those things because you enjoy those things not because other people are going to approve of you enjoying those things. And you have to take your own decisions and live your life according to your own standards and values. And, you know, everybody else that is telling you what to do and society is telling you how to act in a certain way. Well, fuck that. Live your life on your own terms and just enjoy yourself and don't have this constant need to, you know, win over people's validation. And what's so sad about this is people are falling in this trap and people are not living lives that are true to themselves. A lot of people are not even following their passions in life. They're not doing what really, you know, makes them happy and gets them out of bed every morning. They're, they're following the money so that they can live a certain lifestyle and buy certain things such that they can satisfy their incessant need for validation. And I'm saying a lot of people, I'm not saying everybody, some people are actually passionate about making money and that's what, you know, motivates them every day to get up and go and work and these people are doing the right thing they're living according to their own beliefs and their their own passions and they're they're being themselves they're being honest 
and those people are the ones that are attractive. I mean, it's the intention behind the action. The person that buys a Ferrari because he actually likes cars and, and he's passionate about it is going to be attractive. The man who drives a Ferrari because his only intention is to get validation from women, well, only insecure women are going to be attracted to him. Secure women that actually know themselves and are honest are going to be repelled. And those are the kind of people you want to attract in your life and you want to befriend. And you should be using that filter of honesty from the start to filter out the people you don't want to be with and the people you do want to. And the big culprit here is obviously not music. It's more the whole consumerism and materialistic, capitalistic culture we live in. But, you know, music is a huge factor in determining cultural movements. You know, in the 1960s, we had the whole hippie movement. You know, a big thing that kick-started all of that was the music. And now today we have this materialistic individual movement and, and a big factor in it is the music, which is kickstarting and supporting that movement because, you know, people listen to music all the time. It's the most universal media that people consume in terms of art. And if the main message today is that you need to be better than everybody else and that you need to spend money and have a certain lifestyle in order to be cool and that it's not about individuality, it's about how much things you have and how many women you can have sex with and how much money you have, well then a lot of people are gonna follow that message and live unfulfilling lives. And so that's why the fact that music has lost its soul is bad in the first place and the fact that the only emotion that it chooses to convey because it's the emotion that sells these days is vanity is horrible. And that's why you know music needs to wake up and, and become better and maybe revert back to a couple years to doing what it did best, which was actually conveying the emotion of the artist in a vulnerable, imperfect way, which made it human and gave it its soul. All right. So thank you for listening to this rant. And just for the record, I do enjoy some modern music and some there's all kinds of modern day artists, which are true artists, and I respect them a lot. I just think they're few and far between. Well, you know, maybe they're not. They're just not the popular ones. And so the people who choose who's popular and the people who choose you know, like the producers, the, the record company, the label company owners, those are the ones who choose which songs make it on the radio and, and which artist gets the deal. And, and the artist itself doesn't even have full control over which kind of song he has to make. It's the people at the top of the labels that decide all that. So these people need to wake up and, and make music great again. Thank you.